Hello and welcome to Eremus Soccer as we follow the England women's journey through the uh, FIFA World Cup 2023. A uh, very special guest uh, this afternoon. We had the excellent Anthony DiCicco in for the 1-0 win over Heidi. And today we have Sean Spencer. And uh, Sean, you have got some uh, high-level experience in the women's game, for, uh, certainly higher level than me on the women's side. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences and your resume uh, coaching women's soccer? Yeah, so I I actually got my start in women's soccer in, in England, the northwest of England. As you can imagine, it's very, very competitive to get into the men's game, especially as a, as a young person going through university and going through the badges. And I was fortunate enough to get, a, get an opportunity with Blackburn Rovers Centre of Excellence at the time. And this was, this was around 2008. And I was, I was coaching like U15s and U14s, which was, which was an amazing opportunity at the time. And then fast forward a couple of years um, through basically knowing people in in the women's game, I got the opportunity to take over the city that I was living in, Preston, Preston North End's women's team, and had a pretty successful season with with them. Um, we we managed to get into the the semi not the semi final the quarterfinals of I think it was the FA Cup against Aston Villa who were a Premier League team at the time a WSL team uh, that was before the WSL two came in so it was the the league just below the WSL and yeah thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed my my time there and and since. Since sort of that that period, I've always been a massive fan. I was lucky enough to get a job in South Korea, where England's uh, Hope Pals team came out, and they were they were playing an international game against New Zealand. So I was able to to meet a few of the players, most notably uh, Kelly Smith. So yeah, it's it's been Kelly Smith is a legend, huh? I know. Um, yeah, so since since then, obviously, I've been involved in the men's game quite a lot, but I've always always sort of followed and watched the the women's game. And now living in in Seattle, we we have one of the the best women's team in the uh, in the country. So uh, Olympic rain, and then obviously Portland Thorns. So yeah, it's good it's good to um, be watching watching the World Cup, even yeah. with the uh, the what do you call it the time difference. <laughs> And your men's resume was uh, pretty impressive too. I know you spent some time with uh, Paul Ince uh, at Blackpool in the English second tier, right? Yeah, I. Um, so when I was doing my A license, uh, Paul was on on the A license, and then <laughs> we we actually properly introduced each other through me getting cleaned out by him by a tackle. That is an honour, Sean. I know, which he said was he was getting me back for doing the same thing to one of the academy kids that that came in. But uh, yeah, since then we uh, we became friends, and then I went off coaching, and he got the opportunity at Blackpool, and then I went I went into to Blackpool with him, which again was was an amazing experience because um, at the time I was only I was only twenty eight, and uh, yeah, we recently. Got back together um, during the men's World Cup for uh, like warm weather training in in Tenerife with with Reading. So I spent spent a week with them there doing a little bit of coaching. Good stuff, good stuff. And just so the listeners know how far back we go, um, me and Sean first met in two thousand and five, I believe, maybe two thousand six. Yeah, um, two thousand six, working for. Uh, MLS camps out of the Real Salt Lake office, and that is um, that was uh, I was twelve month into um, living in America full time, and I'll be honest, every time an American asked me about women's soccer in England, I used to say it was borderline non-existent. You know, in, in all my life in England, I'm um, up to the age of 25, 26. Um, I just don't remember it having a footprint um at all in the media. I didn't see a live game. The first uh, full games of women's soccer I attended live were at college teams I worked, and I did enjoy it and get into it. And But I even remember in 2015, I drove up to Ottawa to watch England v. Norway. 
in the Women's World Cup. And at the time, England had never won a knockout round game, I believe, in any tournament, Euros or World Cup. And I, I was talking to my friends, uh, Cam and Wyatt Omsberg, um, who I go back a long way with, and I was just sort of explaining how advanced America was in women's soccer in comparison to England. But between then and now, it's it's exploded. We went from winning a winning a knockout round game for the first time in 2015 to going on to the semis. Um, I think there was another semi final in there. We've won the Euros. Like what? As someone who's been more on the inside, what what do you attribute this um, growth in the women's game in England to? Short answer: money mm-hmm. and <laughs> resources. Like I, so, you you were mentioning. So my first first proper memory was two thousand and five. I got tickets to go and watch England. Uh, it was one of the Scandinavia teams. I don't know if it was Norway, Denmark, or or Sweden, and it was at Ewood Park at Blackburn. Um, and then I remember speaking to a few players that were, um, you know, pretty pretty high up in the women's game back then. You know, and they all they all had jobs or they were at university. And there was no opportunity for them other than getting a scholarship in in America, and that was that's what what players were doing then. They they had no no choice but to you know go to college in England and then try and get a scholarship in America and play in in America. And I think you know the FA finally started putting the resources in. And that sort of expanded out into the local regions, you know, so like Lancashire FA and Sussex FA and East Riding, they started to get a little bit more funding to to put into the women's game. Because before that, it was, like you said, non-existent. Now, here's an interesting question, because... I don't know if this is true because I wouldn't call myself a women's soccer expert, just a an outside observer with a keen interest in it. But before the FA started to invest money, and I remember Alex Morgan coming to Tottenham, and I remember all these big Americans coming to the Women's Super League for the first time, and I can see now the documentary on Chelsea and that. But before then, was it a case of America almost helping out the rest of the world like they did in the NBA? Because we suddenly have an expansion and a boom of countries who can play high-level basketball. But it seems to me all their best players come and hone their craft in the American college or pro game. I know Kelly Smith was in America. Um, I know there's been a ton of these England players in America. Do you think before the growth of the Women's Super League, uh, English women's soccer slash football was benefiting from sending their players to America primarily? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Because it was... It was giving them that opportunity at the perfect time in their life, as you know, becoming a young, a young adult, they were able to play full time for the first first time, pretty much. And not only that, they were they were given the resources, you know, because they would have the diet. It was treated professionally. Um, you, you know, they're playing in these these stadiums, which they never had the opportunity really in in England uh, as certainly some of the other countries and you, you've seen it recently with uh, the Philippines you know half of their squad is playing in America gone to university in America playing at university in America playing playing for clubs and I think uh, who was it it was the the goalkeeper for for Haiti she couldn't get a good Kelly Theus, I think the name was. She was yeah, good. Yeah, she she went two years not being able to to play until you know she found an American team. So yeah, it, they've absolutely been paramount to to the growth uh, growth of the game. And now you know, finally and and rightfully so, other countries are starting to to put the resources in, and also which is important um, to sort of take the strain a little bit off. Like in England, the FA is clubs are starting um, recently to 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 support the women's side. You know, I think it was like 20, 2014, around that time, Liverpool started taking the women's side seriously, and then recently now Manchester United have started to take the women's side recently with with their team. Um, but yeah, up until again. 
super recent. It, it has been America doing all the heavy lifting in terms yeah. of developing players worldwide. Good stuff. So on to this game. Um, England beat Haiti. Hard work, right? one nothing. Lots of chances for Haiti. Uh, De Mornay, fantastic player. Um, Denmark beat China. Hard work again. one nothing. 89th minute. So this is a uh, pretty big clash here in the group. They both won their first game. A draw has them in a good spot. And a win pretty much sees them right in pole position, if not through to the next round, depending on the next game. Um, mm -hmm. England, pretty similar. Uh, they got, I'm just reading off the lineup here, they got Earps in goal. They have moved uh, the left-back Greenwood into centre-back to play with Bright and shifted Carter to the bench. We have the very, very impressive Lucy Bronze at right-back. Uh, the left-back's really interesting because this can't have happened before in world football. We have <laughs> a striker who's won the Golden Boots in the Women's Super League um, drafted into left-back for a national team. Interesting. Thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, and and also not only like Aston Villa. It's a daily, but, by the way. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about like Houston as well. She'd done it for Houston Dash. Then she's gone come to England to be the top goal scorer, like you said, and now she's playing left fullback. Now, yeah. I I would love to know the reason why that's happening. Is it? too many strikers and she would be lower down the pecking list. I don't think that's true. And then is it, we just don't have enough cover on the left fullback. I don't. My guess, having watched these two games, Russo is very big, very strong, very Didier Drogba prototype with a couple of fast wingers. And maybe we just fancy Russo right now. That could well change after this game. And you might see daily center forward for the China game. And then they decide going forward. Um, yeah. it's worth saying though she is an excellent left back as well it's not like she's struggling there no I yeah I, I agree but like you said I've never witnessed anything like that before <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, if anyone is watching and has an example please put it in the comments because I believe this is a very rare one off in football history Um, midfield we got Walsh Stanway and Toon same as the first game Chloe Kelly on one wing Lauren James uh, replaces Lauren Hemp on the other wing and Russo is retained as target man slash target woman striker. Uh, yeah. for Denmark, we have uh, Christensen in goal, Vehe, Boy, Pedersen and Sevek at the back. Kuhi, who uh, is a Harvard University player, home guard and Hasbo in the middle, Madsen and Thompson on the wings with the captain harder up front. Um, Denmark and England, they're going into this. It's a big game. If you're the coach of this team, are you even have a draw in your mind with knowing you've both won, you've both got three points, or are we going all out for the win here and thinking about workload management in game three, or are we not thinking ahead at all? As Denmark or England? Either. They're both in the same spot, really, right? They've both won their first game. And yeah, then I, I, if they win this one. I feel as though I feel as though Denmark understood where they were compared to England. However, I, I feel as though certainly that first 25, 30 minutes, Denmark have have, have maybe give England a little bit too much respect. Well, um, I mean, how far behind England do you think they are? Because I don't know if the gap looks that big watching. No, it wasn't, and that's why I was saying I think it. I think it was a mistake. But obviously, Denmark are looking at England, you know, and they're like, well, you know, respect. They won the Euros. They've, you know, they won the first game in the World Cup. It is a World Cup, and I think I think Denmark went a little bit too negative. Like I understood that the game plan was, you know, to to kind of let England have possession and then counter attack, which I think is fine, but. You know, there were there were times when the centre forward was, you know, twenty yards in front of the the centre backs. They were just way, way, way too deep, with with no outlet. Even when they won it, it would go forward and then come back because there was nobody, nobody um, as a striker. And then twenty five minutes into the game, you know, then they started to sort of push push up a touch. And and started to get a bit more of a grip on the on the game. 
as far as as far as England, so I think tournament soccer is very very different to you know league soccer, and when it's a World Cup and you're in you're in a different country and you're playing against these different nations, then you know you've seen it with the best teams over the years that you know men's and women's America Germany's. Um, they never, and Argentina most recently at the Qatar and the men's game, they never really get off to the strongest start. You know, they they, they do enough to to win, and yeah. I, and I feel as though you know that's where where England are at the moment. I, th- I think you know playing against ha- Haiti was, uh, you know, it's a slippery one because it's you know their first World Cup. They've got good players. And for England, they're expected to to win this game like five zero. And you know we've both been in the game long enough that it, it doesn't work necessarily like that. Yeah. So then then you get through that one, and then you're going into to Denmark, and it's again it's a, it's it's a similar thing. You've just got to be professionally, which they were. Um, you know they set up controlling controlling the game. Um, and then I, I think I think they just got a little bit rattled when Walsh got that injury, and that changed the dynamic. Yeah. Now, if I can rewind a bit, we're just going to talk through to catch listeners up on the details of the game, but it yeah. very much followed the pattern you said. Um, second minute, you know, there's a real statement of intent for me because Lauren James, it's a nice pass. England have got six bodies forward right away. The left winger twists and turns, passes to the back post, Right back's up there. She's offside, but that is a real statement that we're coming forward today for a left winger to put a cross in and the right back to be the one on the end of it. Um, And then the goal comes pretty early too, and it's a banger, right? You know, mm-hmm. Daly comes in as the left back. Um, She gets the ball from Walsh. She finds uh, Lauren James. She the Lauren James turns to goal, sort of shifts the ball sideways a little bit to open it as passing lane and just... It's a beautiful finish. You know, the keeper's got all the way there, but it's just hit too well. 1-0 England. Wonderful, wonderful goal. Uh, immediate response from Denmark. You know, they're almost within a minute. Um, they get forward. There's a shot that goes uh, high into the goalkeeper's hands, but they're certainly uh, jarred into response. And then there's, uh, in a fairly upbeat start, there's two more corners for England. Um Daly and James are pairing well on the left flank. So as much as it's surprising that Daly's a striker uh, playing left back, we can't say this hasn't worked because she's playing very, very well. Um, back post cross, what will become a pattern of the game is Lucy Bronze gets the gets up, heads the ball down, and uh, Chloe Kelly sends a bicycle kick to the moon. But England, uh, they do look good. Now, I had a question for you because... St. George's, the England training ground of the England men's team, the England women's team and the England youth teams, they say things about DNA, they say things about identity, and I've become cynical about this because I've just seen it so often from clubs and academies where they make this noise about the way we play, and then really the team just mirrors the style of the individual coach, and there isn't actually the thread that they market. But when I watch England women, I do see similar patterns, similar philosophies, similar build-up, just a lot of similarities with the England men. You know, getting the centre-backs on the ball, driving forward, getting the wingers in pockets, centre-backs finding them, full-backs overlapping, singular forward, able to play back to goal with runners going past. I, it does look like, you know, Southgate and Wiegman have had at least a few conversations sharing ideas, and I do personally see some similarities there. Is that something you've noticed, or am I just off out of my mind here? Yes, I, I would agree with you. My my only thing with it to play sort of devil's advocate a little bit is yeah. it's it, it's the well known way to to play. You know, we're in the we're in the generation now, aren't we, or the era to um, to go Taylor Swift on it. <laughs> I know I just had a weekend of Taylor Swift, so it's on the brain. Good for you, uh, brother. Lucky guy. Of the, you know, the Guardiola era and mm-hmm. how Man City play. And I think that has certainly trickled down into, into England, into St. George's Park, into Southgate, um, and, you know, and and the women's game. It's this positional 
type of soccer and and i think that's ultimately what we what we're seeing now my my only like criticism of of that is are we are we trying to to chase something that is always going to be like one step away or one step in the past and then you know the game moves on next season and again England are behind that 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 would be my only question but in terms of in terms of the women's game and having watched like Australia is a great example Australia everything is crosses everything's you know to the big number 9 corners set pieces um and and there's quite a few other teams like that and i think i think playing you know positional play for for England and for England's women is is definitely a massive plus in in the women's game because i just don't think there's many many teams doing it and many teams doing it well where in the men's game it's slightly different where England are trying to play that way but there's better teams doing it yeah all right 25 21st minute Lucy Bronze she's at it again sends in across to the back post in the direction of James uh it looks first uh at first like James gets a weak shot but the defender shows uh, the replay shows the defenders knocked it back to the goalkeeper Christensen who makes another save a minute later when Toon sends a shot from distance but honestly it's right at her and then uh 24th minute we get the first real scare for England uh Daly turns it over Denmark come Madsen shoots wide under pressure from Greenwood and um it's funny because I'm going to talk in real time here because my opinion changes as the game goes on but yeah. England give the ball away about 25 30 yards from their own own goal here and they sprint back. And there was another play in Heidi where I noticed it, and you're just thinking this team is big, strong, organized, quick in transition. This is a good team. And, you know, after a turnover that high up the field, Denmark go to the box, and the numbers are 7v4 in favor of England, which in transition is very, very impressive. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking watching this now. As the game goes on, as we're going to talk about, not so much. I'm actually starting to wonder if the Achilles heel of this England team is transitions after watching them play this 90 minutes v Denmark and with Haiti and some of the end-to-end -end counter attacks they're giving up. But uh Denmark come again soon after this time. Uh Thompson fires over. And I don't feel like possession is evening out as I watch this, but I do feel like the game is evening out. Because I feel like while England probably have two thirds of the possession, two thirds of the possession gets England a chance every five minutes. And it looks like it's starting to get Denmark a chance every five minutes. They're more direct. England's moving the ball around, but uh, you know, I don't have the XG, but I feel like from minute 20 to 40, the XGs would be similar, even though the possession would be heavily in favor of England. Um, yeah. England are really starting to creak in the 28th minute. They give the ball away again. Um, it's this time it's on the edge of the Danish penalty area and the centre mid home guard gets the ball. She probably carries the ball 30 yards right up the middle of the field without any pressure, which is the concerns I'm talking about. She feeds harder, who forces another save from Earps. Um, Earps is a good goalkeeper. Um, 31st minute, England corner. Lucy Bronze gets up at the back post and heads over. It feels like every single England corner goes to the back post, goes to Lucy Bronze, Everybody knows it. Nobody can stop it. Is that is that a pattern you noticed there? Yeah, she's quality, isn't she? Yeah, she is a presence. You know, she's good on the ball. She gets forward. She can cross. Good first touch. And she is an absolute force of nature. The timing of the jumps, the speed she contacts the ball with, it's, it's just very, very good. Um, 30, 35th minute here. Um a pretty significant passage of play, which you hope doesn't become pivotal for England in the wrong way, because there's another counter and it's broken up by Walsh in the centre of midfield. Uh, it's a real shame after. She's clearly injured a knee. She immediately looks at the bench. She gives it the throat cross gesture that she's coming off and getting subbed off. Um, it's a really good defensive play to break up an attack. Um, she's replaced by Coombs and you hope it's not her last play of the tournament. Um, we'll await news on that. But the question I have for you, because you're much less of an amateur than me here, but it seems a very commonly held perception 
that knee injuries, ACL injuries are much, much higher in the women's game than they are in the men's game. What's your experience of that and what can be done about that? Yeah, so, well, firstly... I guess first of all, is it true? Well, you know, you've got to see see the data on this. Now, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, I'm going to go back to 2000, 2008 to, like, 2012. So that that period of time, and I I remember I remember like this issue coming up. Now I was in I was in an environment university environment, and I was also going through my UK SCA, the UK Strength and Conditioning uh, course, which is very very detailed, and and you the tutors highly qualified, all working across the world in professional sports. Um, and and this question this question came up, and I remember at the time I was having the discussion over the basically the the hip went width compared to a man, and we were actually we were going through Olympic lifting with with stuff like this, um, you know the biomechanics of a man, biomechanics of uh, a woman, and then we were also talking about different heights. And and one of the things was women have um, wider hips compared to, to to men, and that's that's a fact, and and you can see that now. One of the the sort of the byproducts of that, or one of the issues with that, is that puts the femur at a at a, a different angle than a man's femur going into the knee, the you know that joint. Now, the issue with if you load that at certain angles, which you do in soccer, you know, you, you've got cutting, you've got jumping, you've got jumping and then being knocked and landing at awkward angles, then basically the, the amount of force that goes onto that joint causes issues. And then that's where, you know, you see all these MCL and ACL injuries. Um, also, now... Fast forward to, to where we are now, 2023, and that's starting to become a bit more common knowledge. It's starting to, to, to come out into main mainstream media, as well as, um, you know, soccer boots or cleats, whatever you want to call them, is they they have highly been designed over, over years and years and years for, for men, for men's feet, and how men distribute the weight. Now that that just quickly, time. John, do you believe here in 2023 that's still the case at this World Cup that England national team players are wearing cleats designed for men? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. something they, I know. They, I might, they might have, you know, they might have a different insole depending on, you know, if a player's got like a fallen arch or you know a heel issue or something like that. But I, I. Imagine that they are standard, standard um, cleats for for men and and women. And you know, we just talked about the hip going into the femur and into the knee, and then obviously that goes down the calf. So the weight distribution is is very different. Now, if you if you think of if you just went on the street and got ten random men, they're all going to walk very very different. They're all going to have a different gait. So the weight distribution in the feet is going to be completely different. Then you take, you know, a group of men and a group of women. You know, it's it doesn't take a sort of genius to understand that issues as a professional adult were in these on a daily basis in training and in and in games. You know, you're going to start seeing issues. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's I've learned something here. And it made me look at it a bit different. Um, on a more micro scale, England have got a concern here because that's a very impressive central midfielder down. And Coombs has thrown right in at the deep end here. Um, so let's see how that plays out for the tournament if Walsh is gone, in which case I imagine Georgia Stanway becomes even more important than she actually is. Um, well, that's disappointing. Uh, th than she already is, not actually is. No hate on Stanway there, who's been very impressive. Um 
41st minute, Denmark, they come again. It's a, you know, it's a turnover in their own half again. They're pressed, harder gets set up. She drags the shot wide. So we get to half time now. And for me, mate, England, when they have the ball and when it's going well, mm-hmm. they look great. Entertaining, technical, quality, up tempo, sharp. It's really fun to watch. You know, like it, it really is. Um, but when on the counter, you know, even the Heidi game, I feel like Haiti had um four or five counters that were right down England's throat that were really made England look a bit disorganized and vulnerable, especially through Demone. Um, you know, there's another four or five here. Um, and when I look at this England team, is is this an Achilles heel? Is this a pattern now where China are going to scout this? And then if we get to the knockout round and our opponent's going to be no joke, as we'll discuss later, get scouted and are, are England vulnerable on the counterattack? And if if they are, why? You know, is is the number six not doing a job right? Is sending Lucy Bronze and Daly so high causing us to be vulnerable? Is the athleticism an issue? I don't think so. But if you're the England coach, how do you fix this? So it's interesting. It's interesting because again, in, in soccer, you can't you can't have everything. Mm-hmm. So I if you've ever read Rhinus Michaels book, the famous uh-huh. It's called Team Building, an amazing book. Um, one of the best Dutch head coaches of all time, one of the best. Now, he the f- first couple of paragraphs of the book is as a as a coach, you've got two choices. You're either going to be a possession-based team or a non-possession-based team. Now, if you're a non-possession-based team, so i.e. counterattack you are it's going to be easier for you to get results quicker because you're defensively solid and you're waiting for the opposition to make a mistake and then you can counterattack now if you're possession based it's going to be more difficult because there's more intricacies that need to be to be worked on certainly on the ball now the issue the issue with um being a being a more a out of possession team is that you are limited on how big you can grow. Now, as a possession based team, it's going to be more difficult. But there's no glass ceiling. You can can achieve all sorts. And now, again, we we've seen that with the likes of you know the 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 total football teams of of the the Netherlands and then Guardiola in recent recent years. Now, England are become a possession-based team. And with that comes issues with counterattack. Really interesting, Sean. I like that. Yeah. And, and and we saw it, we saw it when Klopp took over Liverpool with the men's side. You know, they they had this transition where they were becoming like a dominant team against the majority of the teams. But defensively was was the biggest issue, because quite frankly, it's it's very difficult to get right. So you you said it. What was it? Seven seven players on the front line. You know, you had the fullbacks, you had the the striker, and then you know you had the the, the it's wide. Usually, usually six or seven. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. pretty rehearsed. It seems that the um. The wingers will come into a pocket sort of halfway between the centre back and full back and too deep to mark without breaking your back line. And then the full backs will by by design tear on, which is borderline undefendable, right? But it comes yeah. at the cost of Denmark getting on the ball and we got the girl dribbling 30 yards unopposed in the first half. Yeah, and that's and that's really that's really it. So you have massive strength going forward, but you're also very vulnerable with, um, you know, you've got a high line. You've got a high line, which is great because it's very difficult for, for Denmark to get out of. Now, if one thing starts to break down, if one player doesn't press correctly or a couple of players don't press or there's one of the players that starts to dominate and gets hold of the ball and is able to is able to be somewhat of a quarterback or you're playing against like a Haiti who who have that dynamic striker who's powerful and quick, then you know there's gonna be there's gonna be a risk. 
Now, I, I mean, England, and again, going to the men's game, you see Man City, they're like, well, the risk is is worth it because we will score essentially more than we're going to concede playing this way. You're so right. It's, they don't let a lot in, though, do they, Man City? No, but how it, it's, took, it's took a long time of, you know, you saw it when he took over at Barcelona, hmm. uh, Bayern Munich, and Man City, and then I used the the example of of Klopp to be able to play that way, to to be able to dominate is is very difficult to to get the whole package together and working perfectly. So with England, and that's why I, I haven't I've been like impressed with them because you're like, well, Denmark are going to get chances. Anybody that plays against England will get chances because of how they're playing. However, the growth of playing that way is kind of limitless, which ultimately will win your tournaments, which it has done. See, what fascinates me about that is you're not talking about one game. You're talking about how you look at the game. And I'm a believer the seeds of such things come in how you look at life. An optimistic nature and a pessimistic nature. Someone who grew up desiring victory. Someone who grew up fear and failure. I believe these things play into who you are as a coach. And I can already see you and I look at it a bit differently, but I love it. Like That's great info. But here's a question. Are you saying, and you might be, and if you are, it's fine. It makes perfect sense. You don't do anything about this. You just let the game play out and you say to yourself, we're going to create enough chances. They can't mark Lucy Bronze's set players. We're so stacked up front, we got the golden boot winner at left back. We will score before we let one in, just keep going. And you wouldn't adjust for the counter or because I mean I would, but like that's I'm I'm very like try to be logical about it. And I know that I think think this is where Serena is probably at, and and again, all them coaches that I've mentioned before are at. She'll she'll look at this and look of like, okay, we're playing this way and we're not gonna change that, which is which is fine. Um but what what could we change in terms of like your approach closing down? Can you get there quicker? If not, like can we drop off quicker? Can the centre backs read that long ball coming? Can we do something to interrupt that pass before it gets into the the number nine? Because that's that's where where it's at. It might be like a level seven at the moment. They might be you know closing the ball down pretty well but every now and again they get out of it somehow and you know there'll there'll be some sort of pattern that needs to you know be rectified and again to give you a great example of this this season um you know with with liverpool versus brighton you know you come up against a a coach uh zebra who is phenomenal at being able to play them little intricate passes to get the counter attack on quickly. Now, and then you've got Liverpool that were a little bit disjointed, and you put them two together, and then Brighton have the upper hand. And I think that's where England are, are at at the moment, where they they just need to turn the dial slightly to shut teams down before they can get this counter attack because they're not far off. Agree entertaining team i'll tell you like i'm obviously i'm enjoying it because i'm an england fan but i can't imagine any neutral doesn't en- enjoy watching either of these england games so far um so there's an early corner for england in the second half i'll give you one guess where which post it goes to the back <laughs> one who knocks it down lucy bronze um denmark seem rattled by bronze she's complaining she's got fouled here she probably has been i'm guessing she's been the source of discussion how how free she's getting and she's just She's just unmarkable right now. Um, 53rd minute, though. Denmark, pretty sweeping move. Ends with um, another chance. It gets shot straight at up. I don't think the Denmark finishing is great. There's a lot of dragging wide and firing it straight at the goalkeeper. Um, you're going to have to do a bit better than that with her being the reigning world goalkeeper of the year. Then there's a, um, a period of play where England get three consecutive corners uh, to take the corner count for the game to 9 nothing. Um Bronze rises above the Danish captain harder and really hits a powerful header wide. Um, just a joy to watch this woman play. Um, Denmark corner, Madsen sends in a cross. It's ricocheted off the shins of Bronze, who um, 
who is the better the other end defender in now. Um, the corner's cleared. I would say is a two-horse race between Lauren James and Lucy Bronze for man of the match at this point. James has obviously hit a wonderful goal and just oozes technical ability on the ball. But Bronze is really, really impressive. I personally had Bronze as England's best player during the Haiti game. And there's an argument that the Haiti player, Demone, gets man of the match. Uh, we go into the um, go into the last 20 minutes here. The Harvard striker, Hasbro, comes off. Uh, the PSG forward Vangsgaard comes on and she's she's quite a card to play uh, because in the opener, she's hit the, uh, I think it was the 88th or 90th minute winner, a uh, header against China. So not a bad player to bring off the bench. And I'm sure there was some discussion with, among Denmark fans as to why she was on the bench. Um, 71st minute, I feel like we see Alicia Russo for the first time, really. I thought in the first game, she was excellent. Really impressive, big threat. No, she didn't score. I thought she was good. Here she nudges the centre-back boy off the ball at the halfway line. She drives in on goal, enters the area, hammers a shot wide. Um, I feel like there's going to be some conversation here because Russo, I believe, has had one good game and one okay game. Um, she's not scored a goal. Daly's played well at left-back. But the, uh, my argument would be, in such a strong position... Would you give Daly or, so, or England, uh, Beth England, not the whole team, a game at centre forward against China? Because then you've got 90 minutes of info to make your decision for the second round game. Because if you don't do that and you stick with Russo, I feel like you kind of stick with her for the tournament if I'm running the team. Because I don't know that I would change a starting nine in the knockout rounds if she's played every game. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the centre forward position? Yeah. I... So this this is another like building on what we were just talking about. You know, with, with England being a possession based team and a good possession based team. Now, with that, what they have as well is is size and the physicality. Now, I mentioned earlier, like with with Austria. Oh. So full disclosure, I just had a little I internet. Think I lost you, Stuart. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just had a little internet glitch. So apologies, that's going to come up on the recording. Um, do you mind just very, very briefly summarizing what you said? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So England can compete physically now with with the best of the best of the world, but they're also a possession based team. Now with that, you've you know you've got a you've got a choice at where you want to sort of put that needle you know so you look at like the spanish teams the great spanish teams they have obviously pushed the needle towards technically gifted players um and again you look at the teams like australia I'll give an example and uh, new zealand's another example where they've obviously got the needle towards more physicality now I think that's the decision that you've got with with Russo and 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 Daly. If you go a little bit more technical in that that final third, then I think you choose Daly over over Russo. But if you're wanting to, you know, a bit more of corners and set pieces and stuff like that, then then Russo is going to just give you a bit more presence. And and I think that's probably the 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 quandary that England have got at the moment. Yeah. What would you do, Sean, if you were picking a team? I'd put Daly in there. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Not necessarily because I think I'd finish the tournament with it, but because part of me feels like we've earned the right to change it. And I would like to see a game of Daly and then have that information picking the team for the second round game. Yeah, uh, and, 
that that's the thing though as well like there isn't really a question is there like she's proven it in the in america and she's proven it now in england you know she's a, the best goal scorer so i mean goal scorers should be in goal scoring no, opportunities <laughs> it's a hard argument to argue against sometimes i think that they have a very specific style that they work on in training and we don't understand um and they're playing it, waiting for Russo to figure it out. I feel like I might have done that myself a couple of times where an outside observer who only sees the games would think one thing and I believe in an idea and I want to give it two or three games. Maybe I'm giving them up too much credit. Maybe they're just wrong and Daly should be striker. <laughs> yeah, I guess time will tell. Yeah, I, I imagine it's worth something... mentioning is when England won the Euros, it was actually won by players off the bench, right? You know, like Chloe Kelly came off the bench to score the winner, I believe. I believe there was a lot of goals from subs in the knockout round. So maybe that's why they're not so stressed out and hung up on who starts the game because they've had so much success with people coming off the bench and finishing it. Maybe that takes the pressure off the, I've got to get this right. Don't know, freelancing. Possible, though. Yeah, and especially, again, you know, tournament, tournament soccer, completely different. Than, yeah, you know your leagues and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, got... and also it could it could have something to do with you know creating that overload in the final third. If they've yeah. got position, you know, then fullbacks can pretty much become strikers anyway. Yeah. So we get two scares for England here, um, an overhit cross that has Herbs really scrambling to claw over the bar. And then we've already had one Olympico in the tournament from Ireland, corner going straight in, via whips in a shot here that scares you for half a second as an England fan, and then it lands on the uh, top of the net. And then we enter the last 15, and the subs start coming. Uh, Russo is off. Toon is off. Um, Hemp comes on, who started the first game. And the uh, magnificently named Beth England comes on up front. <laughs> um, Denmark make a double change too. Thogerson and Trollsgaard. On for Madsen and Pedersen, and the coaches are kind of shuffling their pack for the final run in here. I always enjoy the last 15, 20 minutes of a game when you start to see the new faces and the, the system shifts. Um, head a wide from England for England. I'm going to enjoy saying that. And it's a good <laughs> cross from Daly. Now, I feel like every time the WSL Golden Boot winner sends a cross in from the left back position and it's headed wide, Everyone's going to say, I bet you'd have scored that if she was on the other end. So I'm going to say it now. Um, but it's just such an interesting thing to watch, isn't it? But with that said, uh, England's got a presence. It's a good header. She looks full of life. She looks like she works very, very hard. Um, and England have a lot of options here. This must be a fun group to coach through a tournament because you're bringing players off the bench. Like Hem starts the first game. James Conn's on, looks magnificent. So you start games, the, uh, the second game, she scores the winner. Uh, you bring Hemp back in. You bring in this big, powerful forward on. It's it's a good group, man. It's impressive. Um, eighty yeah. fifth minutes, Lucy Bronze. Um, I'm not getting paid to say her name on commission, but she got <laughs> smashes a shot wide, and then England's other fullback Daly is in action at the other end twice. Uh, Denmark go down the other end first. Daly wraps a foot round across to clear it, and then another one comes right back in, and she heads it away. Eighty um, seventh minute. Biggest scare of the game. Uh, Denmark are probably two inches, one inch from equalising here. Uh, the sub, Sorison, she whips in a cross, great cross to the other sub, Vansgaard, after a lovely bit of build-up play. Um, this woman headed home a 90th minute win of each China, and only the goalpost has denied her an 87th minute equaliser be the European champions England. That <laughs> This is an impressive tournament by uh, the woman I'm going to start calling the super sub. Uh, I thought it was in when it left her forehead. How did you feel when that cross swung over? Yeah, the the, the same, the same. And again, after I've I've been watching every game, and it's just headers, corners, crosses, free kicks, and it's just that header that just glances in to the opposite corner. So yeah, I was glad it didn't though. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think one thing to be said for the cross is it does not give the goalkeeper a chance to come out for it, right? It is whipped in, good pace. Um, Earps is kind of frozen. There's no chance she saves it if it's a yard inside the post. Uh, let off for England. Um, 
they hold on. You know, there's a little bit of pressure. There's kind of a overhit ball that Herbs has to deal with, but I think they do a pretty good job seeing it out, even if they're on the back foot. Um, one nil win, six points. For first thoughts at the final whistle. Stop that again, sorry. That one nil win for England. We got six yeah. points on the board. What are your What are your first thoughts as that final whistle blows? I I would be elated being going through all the tournaments that I've gone through. I just like admired the teams like Germany over you know over through the nineties and two thousands. How how they were able to just get these one. One zero wins without really like breaking a sweat, and it was just you know, it was like them just going for a meal, you know, it was just like, yeah, okay, on to the next game. And I and I get the feeling now from from England, it's just like it's just another another game, another performance, another professional performance. Um, and again, it's not it's not perfect, and the you know, you you ride your you look a little bit, but again, just going into like riding, riding your look. If you as a team have been defending for the majority or don't have possession of the ball, when you do get them chances, you're just a little bit more fatigued. You know, you've just haven't seen as much of the ball. You start to like snatch at it. All these little things that results in like what we saw with, with Denmark, you know, so it looks it looks as though it's like you know lucky and and the, the you know could have been easily a goal and in in some aspects like yeah okay there's an argument for that but I, I honestly believe in that just chipping away at a team over the course of 90 minutes when they do get into positions that are dangerous they're just not quite firing as though they should and I think that's what what we've seen a little bit with with Haiti and um, and Denmark. Yeah, I agree. Now, I think an, an an underrated aspect of tournament football, right, is a lot of people are starting to say England aren't scoring enough goals, England aren't clicking going forward. I'm going to guess the percentage of knockout round games that are won by one goal or a shootout by teams who score only one or two goals is exorbitant. And I am wouldn't be surprised, I don't know the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is as many or more teams don't score and win on penalties as score four goals or more. So to me, it's not a concern that they're not scoring goals because so often it comes down to one goal. And do they have the player that can get you that one goal? Of course they do. they got Bruns who can't be handled at set players. they got a big target forward. they got Lauren James who's already scored. they got Chloe Keller who scored a Euro winner. You know, the Hemp's clearly got something about it. You know, there, there is talent all over the place. So they could get that crucial goal. I'm more concerned that if some team's going to scout them, have some pace, pick them off on the counter, you know, get get 1-0 up, England push forward, keep getting counted on anxiety spirals, and that's the way they go out this tournament. That's my fear. Thoughts on that? Yeah, and just going back to what you were saying earlier, like I watched the the Brazil game today, and you know they have a nice, comfortable win the first game, and then the second game, you know they go they go and get beat. So again, tournaments the most important thing. Like if you if you get a win, like it doesn't matter. Like it just a win's a win, and it's the most important thing. Um, in terms of the the counter attack. You know, I I honestly believe that who they go into, you know, they're going to do the preparation. They're going to look at who the threats are and who are the ones that they're going to be trying to release. Who are the ones that are going to be making this pass? And they've just got to refine what they're, they're doing for me. You know, whether that's uh, the goalkeeper comes out a little bit further to sweep a bit more. Or you know the the, the two centre backs are dropping quicker than than they have been. Um, you know, there's a number of ways at how they can just slightly adjust it to to give them a little bit more more security. Um, but I I honestly feel like the majority of the teams don't have the ability, the technical ability, to be able to counter England 
efficiently to to cause them that sort of the problem, you know. Um, and I think I think that's the thing. If they go up against Spain, you know, they've got the quality. They can link them passes together and they can play them through balls. Um, you, you know, France France have that physicality and that speed. So if France are able to get on the ball and play them them balls in behind the the back four, you know, you've got to be a little bit more careful. But if if I'm Serena, all, all I'm doing is instead of being ultra aggressive, I'm just going to bring it back slightly and just close that diff- distance between the back four and the goalkeeper. Yeah. So this next game is no joke. And um, it's a possibility of a logjam. If England do lose to China and Denmark beat Haiti, which is obviously very, very possible, I think you'd have three teams on six points. And we'll see who goes through. So I think England can't afford to just rest people and what have you. Uh, but I do think there's some things worth experiment. You're going to have to figure out who's going to take that centre mid spot occupied by Walsh. You might want to have a look at Daly. Uh, maybe Hemp gets another chance. You know, maybe Chloe Kelly gets a rest and comes back in. I think there's a couple of things. But what interests me is the the possible opponents right out the gate is no joke. I mean, sometimes in a 32-team tournament, you get a second-round game that's a little lopsided. Um, I know I remember the England men's team off the top of my head, beating Denmark 3-0 at one World Cup, beating Ukraine 4-0 at the World Cup, and then the quarterfinals, it kind of stiffens up a bit. But um, mm. this is no joke. They might get Australia, host nation, tough game. They might yeah. get Canada, Olympic gold medalists, tough game. Or they might get Nigeria and everyone will go, you'd prefer Nigeria. Well, would you? Because they've just beat Australia in Australia and drew with Canada. So it's going to be hard. Like, <laughs> you get out this game, which is, let's just say it's 80% likely you get out this group. That is a that is a tough old task first up in the knockout rounds. Who would yeah. you rather play if you got a choice? I Well, firstly, I would want to avoid Nigeria. Because Nigeria are comfortable defending, don't mind not having possession of the ball, but are ruthless at uh, counter-attacking. That's like, literally the worst opponent I could think of for this England group right now. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> and then when when I look at when I look at Australia, Australia is you know what they're gonna do. Can you stop it? Now we've we've spoke at length of how England play. Australia need counterattacks and they need corners and they need free kicks. If they're not in England's half, then they're not going to get them things. So I would be a lot less worried about Australia than award Nigeria. And then I would say Canada, Canada's a bit of a blend of, of both of them. Yeah. So, but then you've also got that little thing of uh, being a host nation for Australia. I would never voluntarily choose to play a host nation anywhere. No. At any tournament. No. So you, you're completely right. I don't think there's going to be an easy an easy game. Yeah. Um, if I had to choose, I'd probably go Canada, just because Australia have got the host advantage. And I think Nigeria are, are just going to pack in, in front of that 18-yard box, win the ball back, and then they're just going to... And they're visit- in story right like Randy Waldrum who was a guy that he coaches in America at Pittsburgh University he's been kind enough to interact with me a few times at conventions and on Twitter um, mm-hmm. the Nigerian FA were hammering this guy they were calling him a blabbermouth they were calling him a fool they were shortening his camp from 12 days to whatever they were telling him he could take his assistant I mean this this is phenomenal there's going to be a book or a movie in this if Nigeria make the noise that they look like they could make or maybe even turn over England. But, like, what a fascinating story they've been in this tournament. Yeah. I, I like them. I, I think they're a great, great team. Yeah. Well, hopefully we don't see them. <laughs> it's England. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Sean. Really enjoyed it. Next uh, slate of games, we have got uh, England v. China. Uh, China beat Haiti. So England have six points and China have three. And Denmark v Haiti, and Denmark lost to England and beat China. So this is, there's there's life left in this group, right? This is not a procession to the knockout rounds. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Sean? Uh, no, but just just on that, what you were saying, 
it seems to be the trend with the majority of the groups. You know, Switzerland are on tonight. Their group is wide open. Uh, you know, you got the. I was watching France, yeah, Brazil. Got France, today. Brazil have got a bit of a uh, log jam there, right? Yeah, and then you know you got the USA group, and it's all it's all very, and it's kind of nice to see, if I'm honest. It's very competitive. Well, it's what uh, people said wasn't going to happen, right? Because we had the last World Cup, we had a 13 nil game, and everyone said the worst thing you could do is put 32 teams in because all you're going to do is have more beatings, and not really, you know, not really. I haven't seen a ton of like real slappings in these results. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it, the, you know there's trends with with World Cups, and you you remember the South Africa World Cup where teams were were going into games trying not to lose rather than trying to trying to win. Yeah. Now I I just wonder if the women's game is kind of on that shift now, where teams aren't necessarily going out to. You know, win three, four, five, zero, but are, are trying to be compact, trying to be disciplined, trying to be organized. So I, I just wonder, there's been elements of it this World Cup. I wonder another four years if that's that's where it's going to go. Yeah, be interesting to see. Yeah. All right, looking forward to the uh, rest of the tournament. Thank you very much, Sean. It was an absolute joy. Yeah, thanks for having me.